We now come to part six of the prehistory of humankind. And now, in this last part, we move to the Americas. And in the next few lectures, we'll describe the sophisticated chiefdoms and states of ancient America. In lecture 31, we're going to examine some of the powerful chiefdoms which developed in the North American Southwest and also in the eastern woodlands of what is now the United States. We begin by describing the origins of the Pueblo societies of the Southwest with their deep indigenous roots in the remote past. We visit Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde, two great centers of ancestral Pueblo societies about a thousand years ago. And we show how interdependence, that common theme in this course, and drought were two major factors in ancient southwestern life. After briefly describing the Hohokam tradition of the southern Arizona de desert, we'll follow maize and beans into the eastern woodlands, where elaborate burial rituals and earthwork construction have been practiced for many centuries. Finally, we'll describe the Mississippian tradition, the apogee of chiefdoms in ancient North America, which flourished about a thousand years ago. Christopher Columbus landed in the Indies in October 1492, an event which some observers have compared to their modern equivalent of finding an alien society in outer space. The impact on Europe, on the ideas of Western civilization, was enormous. And as European explorers, missionaries and settlers fanned out over the Americas, they counter encountered a staggering array of Native American societies. Teeny bands of hunter-gatherers foraging over vast territories in desert lands. Others living off salmon fisheries or in tropical rainforests. Others subsisting off sea mammals and fish in the high Arctic. Then there were subsistence farmers cultivating every kind of temperate and tropical environment imaginable. It is said, with considerable justification, that probably the ancient Native Americans were the most skilled farmers in the world in 1492. And the newcomers came in contact with other, far more elaborate North American societies. Communities of southwestern farmers dwelling in large mud-brick pueblos in the southwest. Volatile, elaborate chiefdoms with sophisticated religious practices and burial customs in the south and the southeast. And the same diversity extended into Central and South America, where magnificent pre-industrial civilizations dazzled Spanish conquistadors and soon vanished in the face of epidemic diseases and aggressive conquest. Part six of the prehistory of humankind describes some of this extraordinary diversity of agricultural and state level societies. In lecture 18, we told the story of plant domestication in the Americas and described maize, beans, and a wide variety of other native plants, including the potato, as the staples of Native American societies. But the staff, staff of life for North America were maize and beans. As we saw in that lecture, maize spread northward from Central America into the Southwest and was well established in this arid and demanding region for agriculturalists by the time of Christ. By 300 BC, many centuries of experimentation 
in this very unpredictable agricultural environment had resulted in much more productive crops of maize and beans and as a result a greater dependency on farming throughout the southwest. The cultural changes of these years included more permanent settlement. But it was not until about AD 600 to 800 that permanent villages appeared in any numbers. These were the centuries when the three great cultural traditions of the ancient southwest came into being. The ancestral Pueblo, formerly known as the Anasazi, Hohokam, and Mogollon, the latter a mountain tradition which became part of ancestral Pueblo tradition after 1150. Now, as we've seen again and again in this course, almost no human society is completely self-sufficient. And in an environment like the Southwest, where fertile soils are distributed widely over the landscape in patches, and where food resources of every kind occur in bunches over large distances, no Southwestern community, however humble, was completely self-sufficient. They relied on one another for such utilitarian commodities as pots and for luxuries like turquoise, which came from the Santa Fe area, and copper bells passed from hand to hand over large distances. As far as we can tell, this intercommunity trade was highly organized. Until about AD 700, people in the northern southwest lived in oval or round pit houses, dug partially into the ground and then roofed with mud-covered timber frameworks. But over the next three centuries, there was a change. People began to move out of pit houses into settlements of multi-room dwellings and storerooms above the ground. Eventually, the rooms abutted one onto each other to form pueblos. Why? Because this is a relatively a thermally efficient way of living above ground in a, con a, a landscape with very hot summers and cold winters. Between about AD 750 and 900, and many of these dates now are fairly accurate thanks to the use of, use of tree ring chronology which counts the concentric rings on felled trees and compares a master curve of thick and thin rings to the rings found on beams in pueblos preserved in the black, dry climate, we know that village settlement expanded greatly throughout the northern southwest and especially on the Colorado Plateau. The ancestral Pueblo societies that resulted often congregated in Pueblos of considerable size. And what's interesting is that these were often shaped in small arcs to make the rooms equidistant from the subterranean kivas, the sacred rooms in the middle of the settlement. So you've got developing in an environment where the carrying capacity of the land is generally very low, a remarkably dense settlements, heavily populated, lots of people crowded into relatively compact settlements. The largest and most spectacular of these pueblos developed in more densely populated areas like Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, and Mesa Verde area in the Moctezuma Valley in Colorado. By far the most spectacular of these is Chaco Canyon, with its dramatic cliffs and its great houses. It was a center of dramatic flowering of ancestral Pueblo culture between about A.D. 900 and 1100. The canyon is famous for its great houses like Pueblo Benito, which were important ritual and trading centers, multi-room centers and multi-stories in arcs around large kivas. 
But these great houses are a bit of a mystery. You see, Chaco Canyon soils, we know from pretty sophisticated agricultural studies, couldn't support more than about 2,500 people. So it's been argued with some convincingness that Pueblo Benito might have been a place where food was stored in large quantities and used when large numbers of people from the isolated communities around congregated in the canyon for major seasonal ceremonies, also for trading purposes. What's interesting is Chaco is a canyon in the semi-arid landscape, is that the influence of this place extended over an enormous area. How do we know this? From tracking its distinctive pottery and from its extensive road and water control systems. The influence of Chaco extends over about 25,000 square miles of the San Juan Basin. There were outlying water control systems controlled and um, connected to the canyon by ceremonial roadways. This was a landscape. But the purposes of these roadways and what made this huge system, sometimes called the Chaco phenomenon, work is a mystery. Was Chaco Canyon a major ritual and market center? Or was it an unusual concentration of settlements headed by powerful chieftains? We don't know. But it was a remarkable, unique flowering of Anasazi architecture and culture which flourished until about 1130 AD. Now, one of the great advantages of having tree rings, and they have hundreds of samples of tree ring sequences now from the southwest, is that they can not only date places like Chaco very carefully and very precisely, but they can also track droughts, because droughts in tree rings are reflected by thin growth rings. And so precise now are the tree ring data from the southwest that they literally can track the progress of a drought from northwest to southeast across the southwest. And the droughts around AD 1130 were very serious and Chaco collapsed. The canyon was largely abandoned. The focus of ancestral Pueblo settlement moved north and new major population centers developed in the Moctezuma Valley in Colorado and in the Mesa Verde region. And between A.D. 1200 and 1300, people moved from dozens of dispersed hamlets into crowded pueblos, the most famous of which is the famous Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde, which has 220 rooms and 23 kivas. Rooms sharing walls, storehouses, kivas, all jammed, many of them in rather remote and inaccessible places. And then, after 1300, the entire San Juan drainage was abandoned, almost certainly as a result of drought. And the so-called ancestral Pueblo collapse, and that's a gross overstatement, has long been touted as a mystery. But if you look closely at ancestral Pueblo and modern Pueblo cultural traditions, you see that there is a deep-held tradition of movement. Movement in the face of drought and unpredictable rainfall. And it seems that as a result of this prolonged great drought, that the people of these crowded pueblos simply dispersed elsewhere, where there was more water, where they had relatives with whom they could live. And many of the ancestral pueblo from Mesa Verde and Moctezuma Valley, appear to have dispersed south and southeastward into the lands of the Hopi and the Zuni, where their descendants live to this day. So here you have these dense ancestral pueblos, ancestral Pueblo settlements at the end of the first millennium and the beginning of the second, and then suddenly they disperse, and after that other pueblos arise in other places, right into historic times.
In the southern deserts around Tucson, the Hohokam flourished. Desert farmers who were first identifiable in archaeological sites around AD 300, and their culture endured and flourished until 1500. For many centuries, their ceremonial life and trading activity centered around places like Snake Town, a major Hohokam settlement near the Gila River in southern Arizona. The Hohokam traded with other parts of the southwest. Again, you've got interconnectedness. They even obtained seashells from the distant Pacific coast. And they acquired tropical bird feathers and other luxuries from Mexico. There again, there was a widespread trading pattern, which endured and changed over many centuries. Again, Hohokam did not vanish completely. The cultural heirs of Hohokam are the Odohom people of today. Southwestern Pueblo societies developed into theocracies, a form of government that regulated religious and secular affairs through both individuals like chiefs and kin groups or through associations or secret societies centered on kivas which cut across kin lines. These mechanisms, which clearly were in place in Chaco Canyon, at Mesa Verde, in Hohokam, fostered a sense of community and allowed for communal works such as irrigation. Southwestern Pueblo culture was unique and a magnificent and brilliant adaptation to an extremely demanding and unpredictable drought-ridden environment. It is astounding what was achieved, but it was only achieved by having a system of government which was extremely flexible, which correlated very carefully ritual and secular concerns. And always here, very important, were the ties of kin, the relationships between individuals, the obligations of reciprocity between family and relatives, which helped enormously in times of scarcity, especially in an environment with very localized rainfall. What about the history of maize and bean agriculture elsewhere in North America? We know that maize and bean agriculture spread across the southern plains into the eastern woodlands of North America during the first millennium AD. This was somewhat later than the southwest, but we also know that long before this, local river valley populations in some areas, in areas with exceptionally abundant and diverse food supplies, the populations had increased to the point that the mobility of many hunter-gatherer groups was restricted. And as we said way back, some of these groups began to cultivate native plants like goosefoot. At the same time, too, we find the first signs of social ranking and an increasing preoccupation with ancestors, burial, and life after death. I am eerily reminded of the great emphasis on ancestor worship in ancient Europe, where communal burials are thought to have marked the borders of territories and to have been a symbolic link between the living and the ancestors who were the guardians of the land. And it's very interesting to note that between about 500 BC and AD 400, elaborate mortuary cults flourished over a wide area of the eastern woodlands. They were marked by a frenzy of earthwork and burial mound construction. And it is these earthworks which caused a major controversy in the 19th century when the first European settlers came over and the Appalachians and the Alleghenies and started cultivating and clearing forest in the Ohio Valley, they came across all these earthworks and the few Indians who still survived there had no idea who had built them. And they came into being this myth of the mound builders, of an ancient European civilization 
that had built these earthworks and created a now vanished highly civilized culture in the Midwest, only to be wiped out by incur incoming Indians. This racist theory was very popular in the popular literature back in the 19th century, and it was not effectively disproven and shown that the mounds were in fact built by Native Americans until the very end of the 19th century. And we now know that there was this fantastic flowering of mortuary cults in eastern North America, which flourished for centuries. The first of these cultures was the so-called Adena culture of the Ohio Valley. The first culture to really elaborate burial mounds. There had been some burial mounds earlier, but these people now began to build ceremonial enclosures and burial mounds for important kin leaders. Between 200 BC and AD 400, another tradition came into being, the Hopewell tradition, an elaboration of, of Adena, which probably was a set of unifying beliefs. It wasn't a society, it was large numbers of village societies who were mainly living off hunting and gathering with very limited agriculture who were joined by probably common beliefs in ancestors and in burial practices and were linked also by an elaborate system of ceremonial exchanges of gifts. How do we know this? Because of the artifacts found in these communal burial mounds. Artifacts buried with prominent individuals. Objects of great exoticness and value. There was, at this time, an efflorescence of artistic expertise and long-distance trade, which seems to have functioned under the umbrella of ceremonial gift-giving between individuals. Presumably, you gave a gift to a chieftain, one of your opposite number, in a neighboring community or community some distance away, as a way of cementing a relationship which allowed a lot more prosaic trade in foodstuffs and so on to go on. But these ceremonial objects included such things as wooden masks, obsidian, a volcanic glass, which came all the way to the Midwest from Yellowstone Park, native copper, which was hammered into simple artifacts, which came from outcrops far to the north in the Great Lakes region, and mica objects made of mica from southern Appalachia, made into the forms of bird claws, human profiles, and so on. All of this trade and ceremonial burial being lavished on a few people. Hopeful settlements were just small villages, but the earthworks and complex mortuary customs hint at this pervasive religious ideology which extended in art styles and burial practices from New York State to as far afield as Louisiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Very widespread, probably never formalized, but these gift-giving and constant demonstrations of prestige and power between these rulers who were presiding basically over village society. And then after AD 400, the hopeful tradition declined. The center of religious and political power shifted southward. And these were the critical centuries when maize and bean agriculture came into widespread use, adding new and vital staples to the diet. An analogy would be rice cultivation in Southeast Asia, which was a sort of kick to the development of society. Here, the new crops came into use as growing populations, and perhaps the growing demands of a small but powerful elite were creating social stress and pressure toward new political and social organizations. Now, maize and beans, as we said, Earlier on, are demanding crops. River valleys were transformed completely as maize cultivation replaced the traditional fishing and fowling and wild plants as the major provider of food. This required organization and leadership.
Major political and social changes soon followed, as the Mississippian tradition appeared over much of the South and Southeast, named after the river. Regional Mississippian societies developed in river valleys and interacted constantly with one another. Their major centers lay in fertile river bottom lands with lakes and swamps. Some people lived in dispersed homesteads, others in compact villages, others in centers so large they could be called small towns. Thousands of farmers lived near major centers like Cahokia on the Mississippi River near modern East St. Louis. Cahokia flourished in a rich floodplain known today as the American Bottom. The great mounds and plaza of its ceremonial precincts dominated the landscape for miles around. Monk's Mound, so-called, at the center of the town and the eastern end of the plaza, rises 102 feet above the floodplain and covers 16 acres. A thatched temple once stood on the summit. The entire Cahokia complex of mounds and plazas and temples and warehouses and homes of the elite covered more than 200 acres. The Saitru precincts depicted the ancient cosmos of the ancient woodlands, divided into four segments and oriented towards the points of the compass. Cahokia lay near a strategic point near the Missouri and Mississippi confluence in a region where northern and southern trade routes met. The ruling families were adept traders who achieved enormous political and spiritual power in a few generations, probably as a result of their abilities at mediating between the spiritual and living worlds. The chiefs presided over a teeny territory by the standards of Maya or Sumerian standard civilization, politically volatile, based on religious beliefs, rooted in ancestor worship and the agricultural site, cycle, Cahokia's power and prosperity, like that of the Khmer states, depended entirely on the authority and charisma of a handful of rulers. Inevitably, it collapsed in about 1250, when other chiefdoms rose to prominence in the south and east. Another major center developed to the south, at Moundville, Alabama. But Mississippian society was never an integrated whole. It didn't cover the whole of the southeast. It was a mosaic of chiefdoms, large and small, ruled by leaders who lived somewhat aloof from their subjects. The Mississippian chiefdoms were past the height of their power when the first Spanish conquistadors reached the Great River in the 16th century. Just like Southeast Asia, these were concertinas, chiefdoms that expanded and contracted according to the ability of their rulers and, of course, according to the ability of their rulers to communicate with other states on the outskirts in a country where the main communication was either by intervillage trail or by the river. Numerous chiefdoms still flourished in the south and southeast at European contact, but the Mississippian was past its greatness. But would these numerous kingdoms have ever achieved the elaboration of Mesoamerican or Andean civilization? Probably not. Most experts believe that the growing season for maize and beans in North America was too short to support the kind of intensive agriculture or high population densities of pre-industrial civilizations like those of highland and lowland Mesoamerica described in the next two lectures. In this lecture, though, we've taken a look at the major chiefdoms of the southwest and the eastern woodlands of North America. We described the indigenous roots of Pueblo society in the southwest, visited Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde, the two major ancestral Pueblo centers, and described the lowland Hohokam tradition. We concluded that these societies were theocracies. And from the southwest, we traveled to the eastern woodlands, briefly described the mound builder cultures at Dano and Hopo, and then described the rise of the Mississippian tradition with its great centers and elaborate chiefdoms, which were the apogee of North American chiefdoms. 
In the next lecture, we'll travel south to Central America and look at the culture of the Maya.